um, was a sub uh, subspecialty and then it evolved into a primary specialty. Um, what do you think brought about the change um, or like what was the, the reasoning behind that, do you think? That's a great question. Um, I think it's an impetus that was always there. I think it's always a, uh, a subtext of everything we did. Um, and I even saw that from my first days and that, you know, IRs originally were, you know, in a group, you know, the way it started out was there was, you know, everybody's a diagnostic radiologist. And, um, you know, I don't even know if people know, even years before that, um, radiation oncologists were part of diagnostic radiology in the, in the 80s. And they broke off and sort of did their own, you know, became their own specialty. And, you know, IR sort of stayed in the house of DR. So a lot of groups, either in academic uh, programs or even in private groups, diagnostic radiologists and IRs are together. And what, what that sort of equated to is even before the start of fellowships really in 1995, it was that some people in the group would do procedures. Some places called it specials or other old names they had, but, you know, the name became vascular and then finally um, interventional radiology. What that meant was a lot of people would, in their groups, read only diagnostic. A lot of people would also do other procedures. Uh, and as things go by with time, people get more and more so specialized. So uh, over time, people realize that I could do the procedures and I'm very good at it. And if I'm going to do that, it's hard to, in many ways, do a procedure, read a scan, do a procedure, read a scan, because you can't really focus on the patient. You can't really focus on the scan. So in a lot of places, the IR started really sort of breaking, not very breaking off, but subspecializing and saying, you know, if you're going to do neuro all the time, you're going to do MSK all the time, and you're going to do nukes all the time, I'm really going to do IR most of the time. And so as everything else in radiology subspecialized, so did IR. And, you know, as you got that to that level, and that really started, I guess, in the late 90s and early 2000s, people started realizing, you know, we're getting really good at what we do. I mean, a lot of surgical care can now become endovascular, minimally invasive care. And as that got better, and, and you know, as I are really just sort of skyrocketing in an exponential fashion, you know, that periprocedural care became very important. The reason being is if you did a procedure and send the patient back to the refer or didn't deal with your complications or mm -hmm. didn't know how to, you know, very soon people, the patients wouldn't come to you because why would they come to you when, you know, every other field realized vascular surgery, cardiology, they re realized that, you know, endovascular care or minimally invasive procedures was the way to go, even surgeons. Um, mm -hmm. So in order, you know, they're, they were going to take these procedures back. So at some point, if you're going to treat the patient, you have to treat the patient holistically. And that subtext was always there. And I just think there was a lot of people, you know, really at the SR level who said, um, you know, this is something that I think we need to final, formalize and, and make possible. And so that was years in the making. I, I was, you know, so impressed to watch all the people as they, you know, um, for probably the better part of a decade, really worked, you know, because that, that's a very, you know, hard feat to say, we're going to take a, a subspecialty and make it a specialty. And that was the first new medical specialty in over 20 years. And so, you know, it, it's funny that if you think about medicine and surgery, anesthesia, radiology, they were all, you know, created in the 1930s and 1940s. So mm -hmm. we're, you know, IR is about 80 to 90 years, you know, late to the game. Um, and that's why it's very interesting in terms of what we have and what we have accomplished for such a young field. But that being said, I, I think everybody involved knew it was a necessary step. And that was a really evolution of IR to say, we're not just radiologists who perform, you know, procedures on the side. We are our own, you know, essentially surgical subspecialty. You know, we marry, you know, expertise in diagnostic imaging with minimally invasive procedures. The beautiful part about that is, you know, well, the downside to that is we don't own any organ system. We don't say, you know, if there's a problem in the GI system, you go to a GI doc. If there's a problem in the, you know, uh, female reproductive system, you go to an OBGYN. It's, you know, so we, we don't automatically get the patients, but we also aren't bound by any organ system or any anatomical structure. So, you know, in the future, as, you know, you guys who are the next generation of IRs, think of the most incredible procedures and techniques and devices, you know, the sky's the limit as to what, what we can do as a field um, in the coming, you know, in the coming years. And that, that I think, is the beauty of IR. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful explanation. So when you mentioned, you know, taking care of the patient holistically, um, you know, how do you incorporate outpatient aspects into IR to, to incorporate that longitudinal care? Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I think that's the crux of, of what it is. I mean, to be honest, yeah. it's funny that, you know, outpatient care is not the most sexiest thing. We you know when I have my senior IR residents start with me, you know, all they want to do is be in the IR suite. They want to do the big cases. And I tell them, you know, the, the, the funny part about it is, 
you will learn. I mean, people learn how to use your catheter skills. At, at certain point, you know, you do it enough, you, you know, you get trained well enough, you'll learn how to put a microcatheter places and put a coil in, you know, deploy a stent, really do, you know, some, some advanced stuff. And, and that, that comes with time and experience, but you'll get there. But what I tell people is at the end of the day, it's funny how as medical students, when people come in, it's, it's you know, I ask people, why do you go to medical school? And when they come interview with me, they say, it's compassion, it's patient care. It's, you know, I want to do something in the sciences and, you know, medicine really marries, you know, the, the, the service, you know, aspect of, um, you know, life with, you know, the, the science. And, and once you combine those two, that, that's the beauty of medicine. And the funny part is, and I don't mean to say this in a bad way or, or a cynical way, but, you know, once you go through residency and training and four or five, six years of endless call and hours and repetition, and that's what you need to get good, somewhere yeah. along the line, I think it, it takes some of that um, compassion away and some of that, you know, the, the, the simple, you know, the simple, you know, service that people want to do. And so the funny part is you can get very used to just doing procedures all the time. I, I saw that in multiple ways by multiple places I trained where you just do procedure after procedure and you forget that there's a patient behind there. And for a lot of people, you know, for a lot of my trainees, I tell them, you know, often when you interact with somebody, it may be the worst day of their life. They're getting a cancer treatment. They're getting a port. Something might be simple, a pick line because they have a really bad, you know, something really awful going on. And so, you know, a lot of times I think clinic is what gives you that humanity back, right? You'll meet that patient. I think it's key for them to view you as their doctor, not as a, somebody who, you know, I'll tell you 95% of people coming in don't know what an interventional radiologist is. They don't know what an IR does or what the field is. So when you come in there, um, for the most part, the funny part I'll tell you, they don't care what an IR is. They just care that you're a doctor, that you're, you know, that you're compassionate, that you're nice, that you can explain things. They don't know often why, you know, I, today I had a, when we come in for, for renal artery uh, stenosis um, consult. And so she didn't really know exactly why she was there or what she was doing, but you know, I, I had to explain that to her. After that, I had an endoleak consult. So these are patients that, you know, not exactly sure what, um, you know, when there's somebody sent, you know, they sent for our expertise. So what I tell people is that point, you really want to take that patient, make them comfortable, make them understand. I, I typically talk about the anatomy, the physiology. And I tell people it's, it's my job to empower them to understand what's wrong with their body and if they want to have a procedure or if they want something else, or if they want a surgery or, you know, whatever they want to. And typically after you explain this, you realize a lot of people, a lot of other people don't explain things very well to patients. So they have no idea why they're there. Once they understand and realize the benefits of an interventional procedure where you preserve their anatomy and, you know, there's no big incision, there's minimal blood loss. Often you don't need anesthesia. You know, people really like that kind of thing. Then on the outside, you know, you, you mentioned longitudinal care, which I love is, and I say on the, on the, on the other end of it is why do you follow patients? And, you know, it's, it's, again, it's somewhat tedious work. And, you know, I tell people, you could be the best angiographer in the world. You could stent everybody and get across and, and really open up people and do the most amazing cases um, and get beautiful angiographic results. And you may never know that every single one of your patients um, occludes at two weeks. Why? Because you never follow them. You never follow them. You don't know you put them on the right, you know, medications. You don't tell them to stop smoking. You don't, you know, you're not their doctor. So at the end of the day, the funny part is, you know, every single one of these patients is a beautiful angiographic result, but they have a poor clinical outcome. And then, you know, it maybe it may make it might make you feel better, but you know, you're not you're not being the best doctor you can to that patient. And that's why, you know, watching these patients at, at two weeks or one month or two months to follow up, you realize, hey, these patients have a lot of pain. I'm going to try to deal with that. These patients have um, maybe a blood pressure issue afterwards. I'm going to deal with that. Um, these patients might tell you what you did good and what you did bad. So you want to get that feedback. But most importantly, you want to know you could be technically good at what you do, but you could be clinically horrible. And so if you, you know, realize that maybe, you know, I, um, you know, making this mistake, those are the changes you can make. It's, it's a quality metric that makes you, allows you to get better. And so I think clinic has made me so much better. Um, that's a hard thing to do in a lot of DR practices. I, again, I'm a private practice um, radiologist. And so for years, I did my clinic in, in a small room, um, essentially what was a janitor's closet. I did a very small room. I used to do my clinic on my off time. And now we're up to the point where we have a five day a week clinic, full-time running clinic. And so these are things that, um, you know, a lot of people have to work for, but it's hopefully going to become the standard of care to where you're going. The last thing I'll say about clinic, which I think is very important is, you know, the whole concept of being somebody's doctor. So for the attending, I think it's critical because, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, a couple of things might happen. One, you, you know, you might have a complication. Well, take it back. You will have a complication. And so I'll tell you, being the patient's doctor and having a complication is a whole different world than, you know, being some guy or woman uh, who came in and did a procedure and all of a sudden patient had a complication. They don't trust you. They don't know who you are. They might think, you know, you did something unscrupulous as opposed to 
you know, you come in and you'll say, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're going to do. You know, I've had a lot of complications with people and they'll say, I knew that was a possibility and a risk. And I, I went through that, you know, I thank you for doing what you did. And I, I understand that risk. And that's a huge thing for, for, you know, for a patient and for a doctor, for me to go through a procedure, knowing that a patient trusts me. The other thing I'll say is on the, you know, the humanistic side also is, you know, for a lot of, pa- you know, a lot of IRs, you know, as we get better and better, you know, you'll keep patients, you know, even who might've otherwise died from a cancer, interventional oncology, for example, you might keep them alive for much longer than they would. And, you know, I'll tell you, I had a, pa- had a patient who came to me for, to, to be, you know, her interventional oncologist. And, um, you know, if you do it long enough, we did multiple Y90s, we did a couple of uh, key mobilizations, and she lived a good quality of life for about three or four years. But, you know, at a certain point, metastatic disease comes back and often these patients will die. So that relationship of telling somebody, you know, we went through her scans and I said, you know, unfortunately the disease is back and she deteriorated very quickly. And so, you know, that trust is not something that you want to say to somebody who, you know, you don't know very well, you just did procedures on. That's somebody who you take the time to know them. I knew her family and I, I got to know them. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you that one of, one of the most important aspects to me was the fact that, you know, you know, as horrible as it sounds, when she was passing away, her wife called me and said, you know, I want, she's asking for you to come and be by her side as she passes. And it was me and her sister and her best friend and her daughter and, you know, people. And I, I honestly said, I, I said, I, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed. I don't think I deserve to be there. And she, you know, asked me to be there. These are relationships that, again, you cannot get being a proceduralist. You have to get being a clinician in terms of right. being that patient's doctor. So those are things that I, I cannot stress enough that, you know, if, if hopefully anybody who trains with me or trains in you know, most places today, they should become that holistic doctor and, and, and practice longitudinal care because it's so much more gratifying. You know, you getting a hug from a patient at the end of the day is better than anything you could stent or embolize or do. So I, I think that's really the sort of the key and um, being, being sort of happy and avoiding a lot of the burnout that, that plagues physicians today. Gotcha. Um, and just one short follow-up question about outpatient clinic. Do you have like a physical office that's outside of the hospital? Because I feel like, you know, from my understanding that when people go to patients go to hospitals, they get lost and it's pretty overwhelming. Do you have like a little office or not little, but you know, a separate office that is more typical of outpatient care? Yeah. So now we have a complete separate uh, building. It's, it's next door to the hospital. Uh, mm-hmm. I will tell people that, you know, people want um, free surface parking. If Again, maybe in a big city, if you can't get that, but if you can, you know, free parking at the surface, you walk into a building, you know, no going through a hospital, no valet parking, no, you know, paying for parking. Um, they want a waiting room. So our office or our, sorry, our clinic looks like any other surgical office, a huge waiting area with TVs, you check in, uh, we have four rooms. Um, that being said, that's hard to build. Nobody's going to want to say, let's spend the time. So everything is local to, you know, who and where you are and what type of practice you have. So mm-hmm. when I started again, I started in a tiny little closet. I did it on my own time, often on my vacation or after hours, um, because patients don't want to see you in between, you know, other um, procedures and, you know, in, in weird places. So we slowly built up um, the way we did it with, you know, for some people, they might want to rent another surgeons, you know, surgeons typically have clinic two, three days a week. They don't do anything with the other, t- you know, a couple of days a week often. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe cohabitate and, and uh, rent a surgeon's you know, clinic office. Start small. And as you see, as you build it up and you get better and better, um, you'll able to get hopefully more and more. The way for us to do it, um, for me, I thought it was, you know, really key is um, a lot of uh, IR docs uh, also practice with veins. So we treat varicose veins. So we actually merged our vein practice, which was a standalone practice in our clinic, so that we have a doc there um, every day. And typically we have residents now there every day. So we do vein procedures and we also see clinic patients all the time. So those two combined really are, are one of the key things I think is one of the best ways to have a clinic is those to be able to do some procedures or outpatient control procedures like varicose vein procedures, or you know, obviously if you want to do pain procedures or something else, you marry those two. It's a really great way to have a clinic while also you know, generating a lot of revenue. Um, but the key thing then, stand alone by yourself, having your own staff, you know, ha- try to make it as high end as possible. Patients will see you akin to any other surgical subspecialty. And that's the key, I think, to, to having a good clinic. Gotcha. Well, again, thank you so much for, for your, your insight and feedback on the field. I think I've learned a lot, definitely, and I hope a lot of other people who watch this will also get a better idea of IR. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for, for doing this interview and, and uh, being part of SAR. I think it's fantastic. So great.